Doris's dad hadn't looked at her once. He sat there reading his paper by the window, licking his fingers and slowly turning the page. He was skinny and always wore his thick suit that made Doris feel itchy. She could hear the whistle of his breath from his nose, moving thick strands of white hair that peered out of his nostrils. It was the same every Sunday, the tick-tocking clock that chimes at 1pm, meaning Mother was bringing tea, yup, right on cue. She came in on her heels with her stuffy little walk and stuffy little steps with a beaming smile that lost its novelty on her honeymoon. She wore a blue flower print dress and red lipstick, looking like she was in a World War II poster. Here we are, dear, Mother's tea. There's nothing this can't sort out. She put the tray on a small table between Doris and her dad, taking the coffee press and pouring a tiny cup and handing it to the man of the house. He didn't look up. He waved his hand out, allowing it to come to him. Doris hated the way her dad did this. She watched his clumsy lips hit the porcelain and the coffee spill on his jumper. His eyes stubbornly fixated to the paper he read. Her mother then poured the tea from the pot into the cup and handed it to Doris. Thanks, mother. How are things, dear? The same as always. I work, I eat, I go to bed. Nothing new. Isn't it your thirtieth next week? Doris sipped on her tea quietly and put the cup saucer gently on the table beside her. I'm not looking forward to it. Don't be silly, dear. It could be nice. And I can put some sandwiches on. Maybe you can bring them girlies from work round here. That's sweet, Mum, but I don't think they'd want to come. They're probably, um, busy. Doris had forgotten she had told her mum she had friends. Unless they needed a shift covering. The truth was the office girls barely looked at her. Never mind talk to her. Yeah, yeah, I am. I, I can't wait, said Doris looking at the pillow beside her. Her mum choked a little, putting her hands on her chest and stared at Doris. Doris? said her mum squinting. Yes? Did you just speak to yourself? Doris went quiet and scanned the room. Even her dad was looking over the top of his paper with his glaring blue eyes. Um, I don't think so. Her mum looked at her dad who gave her a look of confusion, then went back to his paper. Anyway, said Doris's mum in a stretched way, returning conversation back to normality. I really think it's a good idea for you to come round here on your birthday. Remember last year? We don't want a repeat of that now, do we? Mum, please don't bring that up. Things were different then. You know how hard it was for me. I know, I'm just saying I think it would be a good idea if you spent some time with us, just in case your mind wonders, said Doris's mum putting on a little smile that made her cheeks puff out. Maybe you will even bring a nice man. Doris's head went down. Doris was looking at the red rug in front of the fireplace when she heard his chuckling. Doris and her mum looked towards her dad, who had put his paper down on his lap, wiping tears from under his eyes and started to laugh. What's the matter, dear? asked Doris's mum. Her dad took off his glasses and looked at the ceiling trying to stop his laughter, but instead, it started a second wave of convulsions and his body jolted into hysterics. <laughs> oh, blurted her dad. Doris hadn't seen her dad smile for years. For a moment he looked like a stranger. It seemed unnatural on him, like a younger, joyous man had possessed him. Who's going to date that Mary? He said, pointing, his face showing hardly a wrinkle as it stretched. As he looked at her, the laughter slowly got louder. Then he looked away for a second to compose himself, looking at his coffee and sniffling, letting the laughter subside. Then he glanced at her again, and it erupted. <laughs> oh God, look at it! He began again. Doris felt insecurities grow, her thin air, her rook nose, with every cackle from her dad. Doris felt like her belly had grown another roll. She averted her squinty brown eyes away from her dad, putting down her teacup knowing she needed to leave before she started to cry. She picked up her red coat and walked out the house and could still hear her dad laughing as she went through the gate at the bottom of the garden. What the hell did you have to say that for, you idiot? You barely even look at her, and when you do you say something like that? What were you thinking? The old man picked up his paper and gathered himself, laying his eyes on the article he was reading and continued his Sunday ritual. <sighs> well, at least you know why I hardly look at her now, he said, picking up his coffee and taking another slurp. The three of them sat side by side in the staff room, like the three monkeys. The only difference was, they spoke nothing but evil. I fucked Derek last night, said Beth, the brunette, with a flutter of eyelashes. The other two raised their eyebrows, along with her Starbucks, and sipped. Doris sat on the other side of the room, 
pretending not to look at their push-up bras and v-neck tops and the bit in between. Beth looked from side to side through long eyelashes, thick mascara and black rimmed glasses. I don't know what to do guys, I think I still love Stuart if I'm honest. Doris hated the way she talked, it made her feel like a child, but like a child she was fascinated. What about Grey? asked Rose, the beautiful blonde on her left. Hell to him, said Beth. Plus, he doesn't own a Porsche, said Ginger, the redhead on her left. The three giggled, amused by their game called Life. As silence fell upon the staff room, and the coffee's nearly finished, their attention turned to Doris. Doris felt embarrassed. Their beauty and boobs were just too much to handle. She turned red, all the more obvious because of her natural ghost-like complexion. The girls laughed some more. Come on, ladies, said Beth, standing up, making sure her knees stayed together as she did. Wouldn't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable now, would we? Rose and Ginger looked at Doris and stood. Even though Doris had left high school before they had even started it, they felt like the older girls. The three of them left the staff room, with their hips swaying hypnotically to Doris who stared. The moment they were gone, she felt able to breathe. Her hair felt less greasy, her nose smaller, along with her belly. She sat deflated yet steady, happy enough but not actually happy. And while looking at the coffee stains on the staff room table, she got a snapshot of her life. She was a 30 year old virgin, with little prospects and no friends. She hated thinking about this, accepting these truths. She fantasised about having friends, so she fantasised about having sex. It wasn't until now, accepting this fantasy, she realised how awful her life was, how dangerously close she was to letting life pass her by. Would she die alone without ever feeling the touch of a man? At this moment life did one of its funny little tricks. Something happened. Excuse me. Came the calm tone of a beautiful soothing voice that had an accent. Doris looked up at a handsome dark haired man. She hadn't even noticed him enter the room and he stood beside the sink with the instant coffee jar in his hand. Hello, are, are you French? asked Doris. The man smiled revealing perfect teeth and looked at the ground making a lock of brown hair from his fringe dangle in front of his face. He put his hand through his hair, putting it back into place. No uh, hello, not even a bonjour. I I'm sorry, said Doris, hesitating to look at him again. She stood up and took her blue mug to the sink, where she dropped it into the foamy water. I guess you're looking for the mugs. They're above the kettle, she said politely, taking little steps in her heels, much like her mum towards the door. As she did this, his hand reached out and took her wrist, holding it gently. You are just going to leave me alone? He asked in his thick accent. His voice was really beautiful. It was then she realised he looked like her favourite porn star, the one that had sex with girls that looked like Beth, Rose and Ginger. This happened on her laptop in the late hours of the night, but now she had the real thing in front of her. He really did look like him, the eyes and dark stubble. If she could create her perfect man, it would have been him. He stared at her and smiled. Unlike when her dad had done the day before, his smile made her feel special. His smile was with her, not at her. So what's it going to be? She sat down beside him and found out his name was Pierre. The two sat and chatted in the staff room. Time flew by like a butterfly for Doris. She hardly noticed at all. So soon? He pronounced his vows deeply. It made her stomach tingle. I I'm sorry, yes. I was meant to be back five minutes ago. If my supervisor notices, I'll be in real trouble. I see. Will I see you again? I, I hope so, said Doris, smiling. Do, do you know about the work canteen? Sure, the food is terrible, no? Doris laughed. <laughs> you would say that being from Paris, but it's cheap. I, I'll be there tomorrow at one. That's if you want to see me again. Pierre picked up his black coffee and took a gulp as it had cooled down a lot as they had talked. For sure, princess. Doris stood naked in her bathroom. She looked in the mirror as the bath slowly filled. The air was thick with the steam and she leant forward on the sink and closely looked at herself. She smiled looking at her teeth. The steam blurred the mirror and they looked less yellow. The more blurred her reflection became, the better she felt about the details. Her big breasts drooped less, and she focused more on their size. Her skin looked less blotchy and pale, and she couldn't see her scalp through her thinning hair. She just saw hair. The steam stuck to the mirror, and she sighed and felt happy. She then hovered a toe over the bath, 
dipping it and testing it. It was hot, but that's how she liked it. She sunk herself in, and the heat made her itch at first. Then she laid back and enjoyed the heat and bubbles, plus the peace. She lay there for five minutes, trying to banish thoughts, enjoying the moment, but it wasn't long before they crept in. She reached for the shower head behind the taps, knocking a bottle of shampoo into the bath beside her. She then leant back and closed her eyes. At this moment, she often thought about the office girls, mainly Beth, about what she had heard her saying that day, who she had been with, picturing it, imagining her, getting home to a luxurious flat in a little skirt that cascaded down her thin legs and landed on the floor. With Beth exposed, her boyfriend would always walk in. With the shower head pressed between her legs, she got a better idea. She imagined herself and Pierre. She turned the shower head and felt the water and took the pleasure from the pressure. She imagined Pierre's hands. She laid there and allowed ecstasy to do the real cleaning, then pulled the plug. As the water seeped away, she laid there, smiling as her body dried and began to feel cold as reality slowly came back in. She got out of the bath and looked in the previously blurred mirror. It was clear. She looked like a fat, drowned ginger rat. How much Dad would laugh at me now if he could see the state of me. She took the dressing gown from the bathroom door and covered her body up, turning off the light and headed to her bedroom. Beth, Rose and Ginger sat in the staff room canting, bitching as usual. We really need to stop coming here on our lunch breaks. It's really disgusting, said Ginger, picking up a dry chip and throwing it back on her plate. Nobody sat with them. Men had tried in the past, but the condescending tones and looks of disgust had put off all the office Romeos. They often complained about the stock of the men in the building. Too young, too fat, too old, too thin, too bald. Shallow excuses for what was actually wrong with them, their shallow bank accounts. Give any of them a Porsche and a reservation at the Hilton, they would have all jumped on him like a bitch in heat. They played around with their food and drank their bottled water as people watched. It wasn't long before one of their favourite topics walked in, Doris. She walked in and sat down, took out her lunchbox and her bag with a huge smile and a major difference. Holy shit, you seen what I'm seeing, said Beth. Doris laughed and giggled as she sat opposite Pierre. He looked more perfect than she remembered. He wore a slim fit blue jumper that hugged his body tightly, a white collar shirt and he kept running his hands through his hair, trying to tame them strands that always cascaded in front of his eyes. I was thinking of you last night, Doris, said Pierre. What? You were? Why? She said, unwrapping the cling film of her sandwiches. Justine Jemul, I was wondering uh, if I would get to see you today? Doris smiled shyly and found it hard to look at him while he said this. I noticed something about you, Doris, said Pierre, putting his finger under his chin gently. You hardly ever look at me, why? Doris felt uneasy. That question could unveil a lot of suppressed memories, something she wasn't willing to do. So she answered as honestly as possible, without bringing herself into it. Because you're beautiful, said Doris. Pierre smiled and put his glasses on the table. We are all beautiful, but if you don't believe it, nobody else will. Thank you, she whispered, wiping away a tear. Doris ate the rest of her sandwich, then heard a chorus of heels approach her table. Who are you speaking to, Doris? said Beth, with the descending look that seemed almost natural on her designer face. Doris plastered a fake smile, but wasn't happy. She looked at the three girls like wolves who had seen something they wanted. His name's Pierre, said Doris. The three girls giggled and looked at each other as they did. Okay then, said Beth, looking at the other girls. Well, we were just wondering... Um, would you and Pierre want to come round to mine tonight? Some wine? A chat? Could be fun. Doris looked at Pierre and raised her eyebrows. He hadn't looked at the girls yet, which made Doris kind of happy. Hopefully, he hadn't noticed how perfect they were. Pierre smiled, which filled her with a weird confidence she had never felt. What do you think, Pierre? He said nothing but smiled and nodded. We would love to, Beth, thank you. No worries, she said with a real grin. Just remember to bring Pierre. I live at Worthington Way, flat 18, just give it a buzz when you're outside. And with that, the three girls walked out the canteen. Oh my god, Pierre, I don't believe it, Beth invited me, I mean us, to her place. That's incredible. I am happy for you. I can see this means a lot, said Pierre. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I admit, they may be more interested in you, but... No, 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 don't be silly. They barely looked at me, said Pierre. You really think? 
well, of course, they have seen you over here today, smiling, laughing at times, and I think they want to be a part of it. Goes like that always do, said Pierre, with a reassuring smile. Do you think they want to be my friends? said Doris, sounding more serious. Pierre leant forward. For sure, princess, for sure. Doris pressed the metal button on the intercom to flat 18, and felt a little buzz in her stomach. She waited with Pierre, who she had met at the children's park across the road. As they waited, Pierre held her hand which made her feel light. The longer they stood with her fingers entwined, she began to feel different between her legs. I'm nervous, Pierre, said Doris, patting down her coat. Pierre leant in close, and she felt the tip of his nose on the edge of her ear. It sent goosebumps racing through her body as he whispered, Don't be, princess. I'm with you now, he said, holding her hand extra tight. The door opened and Beth stood there with a glass of red wine. Instinctively, Doris tried to let go of Pierre's hand, like she wasn't allowed to be intimate, but he wouldn't allow it, and he grabbed her hand harder. For a second, Doris thought Beth was wearing a bathing suit, but it was a dress. It finished an inch below the widest part of her hips, showing off her long, bronze legs balancing on high heels. Her hair looked thicker, slightly darker, but that might have just been down to the low lighting of the hallway. Beth's breasts were so big, but they looked big because her waist was so tiny. They were on full show and in a push-up bra and a low-cut top, and she stood in a way that seemed to glamorise them. Come on, come in, said Beth. She shut the door behind them and ran awkwardly in front. The bloody lift isn't working, so we're going to have to take the stairs. Follow me. She climbed the stairs ahead of them, and Doris looked up. She was at eye level with Beth's long legs that seemed longer as they walked up the stairs. She looked up slowly and could almost see between her legs, but not quite. Doris looked at Pierre, who had been a gentleman. His eyes were down as he glanced at Doris and smiled. Nearly there, guys. Beth walked down the hallway and entered her flat with Doris and Pierre. They entered the room and Doris was taken away by its beauty. They had walked into the living area and a large window covered the entire wall to their left and overlooked the city, which looked more impressive than Doris imagined. The city lights were beginning to turn on. Reds and whites was the buzz of the city. That could not be heard. Beth's flat matched her dress, black and minuscule. A little black coffee table, black seats, a black TV screen, which wasn't small. Ginger and Rose was the only thing of colour. Ginger the redhead wore a red dress that glimmered in shine next to the lamp she sat next to. Rose wore a blue dress, as revealing as Beth's. So, what do you guys want to drink? asked Beth. I'll have a glass of white if you don't mind, Beth, said Doris. Of course. And Pierre? she asked. Pierre nodded at Doris and smiled. Make that two of them, Beth. Thank you, said Doris. They all sat with their drinks. Pierre looked uncomfortable and didn't seem to want to talk to any of the girls, not even look at them. He sat close to Doris as the women natted about the office which Doris loved. For the first time in her life she felt a part of the popular group. She assumed Pierre was just being polite and he was being there for her as she made friends. As the second glass of wine began to dry up, Beth decided to create some entertainment. So Pierre, you've been very quiet, said Beth squirling her wine glass. A whole expression had turned. You say he's French, right? said Beth, putting the glass slowly on the coffee table bending forward, providing a perfect view down her top. I love Frenchman Doris, she said, standing and taking the empty glasses away. Who's for another? Ginger and Rose smiled like they knew something. Doris didn't. Doris went quiet as she watched Beth walk to the kitchen. She watched her open the door, so Doris had a perfect view of the kitchen. Everyone's eyes fixated on Beth, including Pierre. They watched her bend down, keeping her long legs straight as she looked at the wine rack. She looked incredible. The dress tight to her body, it showed every curve. She looked like she was designed to be. She looked at her audience in the living room. I'm going to need a hand with these glasses, she said, flutting her eyelashes. Could you come give me a hand, please, Pierre? He looked at Doris, too polite to say no, but seeking her approval. Yeah, go, said Doris, holding his hand tightly. Pierre stood up. Is he coming to me, Doris? asked Beth. Yeah, he's coming now, she said, her voice sounding very soft. Doris watched Pierre walk into the kitchen. She looked at him standing next to Beth as she poured another glass. She hated how perfect they looked together. She watched Beth put down the glass and walk towards the kitchen door. Then, oops, she said, slamming the door shut and locking it. Doris looked at Ginger and Rose who watched her like an experiment, intrigued to see what she did next. She didn't pay them any attention. She got up and approached the door calmly as she could, ignoring the impulse to run to it. 
She knocked on the thick wood. Okay, Beth, very good. Now can you open the door? Beth, I really think you should open this door now, said Doris, whose nose touched the door as she itched her neck. Doris began to hear murmurs through the door, little happy sounds that made her hurt inside. Now come on, Beth. <laughs> very funny. Now let's open this door. Doris began to itch her neck harder as the skin became blotchy and red. The sound of scratching became unhealthily loud. She went to knock again, then stopped. She began to slam on the door. Open this fucking door, Beth! Her scratching had turned to clawing, digging her nails into the hard specks of blood that began to appear on her neck. Oh my god, open this door! She screamed, slamming and clenching her fist into the wood, ignoring the pain. She stopped for a moment as she heard a woman's giggle. Her mind raced. What was making Beth giggle? Pierre? Were her hands on him? Were they laughing at this pathetic, fat, greasy woman? How could she make them stop? She grabbed her hair, intertwining the thin strands between her fingers and pulled. A fistful of ginger hair was in her palms. She screamed and grabbed more, pulling again. Rose recalled into the sofa, not believing it was possible what she was seeing. So much hair was being torn from her head. Stop it! Stop it, Doris! Ginger shouted, running towards Doris, who was a bleeding wreck on her knees. She looked up and caught a sight of herself in the mirror beside the sofa. She looked like a half-bald woman, with blood running down her neck. Doris then heard the door open behind her. She looked into the kitchen and couldn't believe what she saw. Stood there in the kitchen was Beth, alone. As she looked at Doris with red streaming down her face, her first thought was Ginger or Rose had thrown wine at her, but it was thick and ran down her body and her palms. They were mangled with blood and hair. It horrified her, repulsed her. Her knees felt weak and her stomach sick. But Doris was seeing much worse. Pierre had vanished. Doris stood slowly with what little hair she had left dangling in front of her eyes. Where is he? She said no longer sounding like a fragile little girl. Her voice was deeper, menacing, possessed. Where is he? She said again. Beth stood still, unsure what frightened her more. The way Doris had torn her body apart or her voice. Doris stepped forward up towards Beth. Her squinty eyes looked black and Beth was transfixed. Where is he, Beth? Doris, what have you done to yourself? Beth asked, beginning to cry. Rare, genuine emotion, realising she'd gone too far. Where is he? Asked Doris again. Doris, what have you done to yourself? Beth asked, beginning to cry. Rare, genuine emotion, realising she'd gone too far. Where is he? Asked Doris. Doris, Pierre don't exist. Doris' pupils widened. As she stood in front of Beth, she put her hands around Beth's hands and squeezed hard. The wine glass crushed and spilled blood onto the floor. Beth screamed and fell to her knees, knees that crashed onto the glass on the floor, making more blood. Beth looked up at Doris and saw the true meaning of pain. Doris's face screamed what made no sound. Her eyes were endless wells with nothing but hate pooling in the bottom of her soul. She pulled Beth's hair in close. Don't you dare, said Doris. She couldn't hear the cries of Ginger and Rose telling her to stop. Doris walked past Beth who stared at her hands that dripped with blood. She walked towards the toaster, slipping out something shiny from the knife holder. As the women cried, so involved with their own misery, they hadn't noticed Doris who now stood behind Beth with a knife. For the last time, where is he? I don't know, screamed Beth through tears and mucus. Doris raised the knife high and Ginger and Rose screamed. Doris brought down the knife to the back of Beth's neck. Doris then pulled out the knife, and for the third time Beth's blood spilled upon the kitchen floor. Her body fell forward, hitting the kitchen floor hard, and Doris was left staring at Rose and Ginger, smiling. There was a silence. Just before the storm. Then the screams came from the women who turned and bolted towards the flat door. Doris jumped over Beth's body. Ginger and Rose, in a panic frenzy, struggled with the metal latch as Doris rose the knife. The door came undone and Ginger and Rose fled screaming down the corridor. Doris watched, waiting to see if one would break their leg in the fall down the stairs. But no, they made it, the exit, and to their freedom. Doris turned and looked at Beth's body, on the kitchen floor. Blue blue eyes, but no life. She walked towards the kitchen and put the knife on the worktop. <sighs> Why'd you leave me, Pierre? She said. Then she heard a voice from behind her. I have not gone anywhere, Princess. Doris turned around and there he was on the sofa looking more beautiful than ever, pouring a glass of wine. Come, come take a seat. Doris smiled and walked to her man and sat. 
taking glass from him. Where did you go? said Doris. Does it matter? Are you real? asked Doris. I make you happy, don't I? Very. Then I am real, said Pierre. Pierre and Doris finished the bottle, laughing together as they looked at the body of Beth. Want to come to my thirtieth birthday party in a few days? said Doris with a smile.